Now at nine, how a nearly 100 year old unsolved mystery is helping push for a safe haven box at the new Joplin fire station. Plus, we'll take a look at the Neosho gun show on its last day. And we'll take you behind the scenes of Pittsburgh Community Theater's production of Biloxi Blues. The four states most watched news starts now. This is KOAM News at 9 on Fox, Fox 14. I'm Anthony Saviello. Nearly 100 years ago, an unknown baby was found abandoned in a bush in Joplin. KOAM Samantha Walker has more on how a century-old unsolved mystery is inspiring a current day change. Walking through the Murfreesboro district in Joplin, it's clear to see there's a lot of history. The historic Murfreesburg Preservation Group recently released a story that's 100 years old. They're calling it a mystery in Murfreesburg. I actually stumbled across it when I was looking through news clippings looking for other things. And I saw where somebody just abandoned a baby in the bushes at this house. In July 1945, a healthy baby girl was found bundled up outside of the home of the prominent Potlizer family on South Sargent Avenue. And, you know, the things to take care of a baby were right next to her. And they're like, hello, whose baby is this? There are numerous theories surrounding the parentage of the red-haired, blue-eyed baby, but they were never identified. So we lean more towards maybe, except for just being a local, that maybe it was a soldier that had come through, through the USO and through Camp Crowder during World War II and fathered that child. The true identity of the found baby has never been announced, but today she would be about 78 years old. According to Phillips, the mystery does point to the need for better options. There's just a lot of instances where they want to be able to, to, to make sure that baby is safe, but nobody know where it came from. Organizers are raising money to build a safe haven box in the Joplin Fire Station number 7. This would allow for infants 45 days or younger to be anonymously left with no prosecution should the baby have not faced neglect or abuse. And that's kind of the whole key. That's why people did the doorstep thing for so long, because they didn't want to go to an orphanage. They didn't want to say, here, take my baby. They didn't want anybody to know who they were. Reporting in Joplin, Samantha Walker, KOAM News. Organizers are still raising money for Joplin's safe haven box. You can find more information on how to donate on our website, koamnewsnow.com. Chief Meteorologist Doug Hetty joins us for a first look at the weather. Well, it turned out to be a nice Sunday for us today. Cooler than what we saw yesterday, but still not a bad day. Just a little bit below where we should be for this time of the year. 56 was our high. Chilly start, 43. Average high is 60 degrees, the record 82, set back in 1982. It has been windy. We have these northerly winds kicking in. Uh, at times, we're getting gusts kind of 20, upwards to 25 miles per hour. It is going to stay breezy tonight, and then tomorrow, the winds will slowly kind of die down throughout the day. But pretty much clear skies. Not a whole bunch is going on here or across the entire four state area. We do have our next little system spinning out across parts of Arizona into New Mexico, and that will give us some rain chances later on in the week. Until then, we're going to stay dry. It's also going to get kind of cold for us tonight. We're going to look at all that coming up here in just a bit. Thanks, Doug. Today was the last day of the Neosho gun show. According to the NRA, gun shows are wildly widely attended by Americans interested in firearms for defensive purposes, hunting, sports, recreation, and historical significance. We spoke with one vendor in Neosho about what he and the show itself were able to offer. Um, basically anything that has to do with the Second Amendment um, or that type of activity, outdoorsmanship, hunting, whatever, you're going to be able to find here at, the, at, at a gun show. Uh, anything from knives to clothing to foods to uh, boots we have here. The event kicked off on Friday and ended this afternoon at 3 p.m. Root Coffee House is getting into the season of spring today with a spring inspired painting class. Attendees were able to mingle with other artists while creating a new masterpiece to take home. The class included a canvas and step by step instructions. I just, I love to paint. Uh, I love having my paintings on the wall, and this is like so easy. She walks you through step by step. I've not had any experience, so she's been very good to us, and if I need help, she'll step in and help me. 
If I don't, that's fine. <laughs> the event was $30 per painter. Some local four staters today had the opportunity to shop for some new jewelry at a pop-up shop in Galena. It included three different stations, a charm bar, clay earrings, and a stack bar. Officials say the event is a way to get a deep dive into different arts and talents. Get out and support uh, your local businesses. There's a ton of small businesses in the area um, and any just opportunity you can get out to help support, it is greatly appreciated. And just, you know, giving our time out and coming out and setting up is a way that we feel like we can give back and uh, interact, so. The shop was held at Erickson & Co. Mercantile in Galena, Kansas. Pittsburgh Community Theater's production of Biloxi Blues hits the stage this Friday. I'm giving you a behind the scenes look into the rehearsals and how I, along with my fellow castmates, are preparing for the show. Two, Two down, three, three, down, four, down, five, down, six, down, seven. It just, uh, it's still a play that is um, appropriate for our times. And it hits on a lot of subjects, a lot of things that we're still dealing with. These men were really entering into a time in their lives of fear and anger was all over the world. And he deals with that and he shows you how, how they overcame their fear. I think it's funny. I enjoy it. I think there's plenty of jokes that are for the military community but the general public will still understand them. Is that your opinion? In my opinion, yes, Sergeant. I really like the fact that he examines and is not afraid to address whatever it is in the room that needs to be addressed. Would you get in your fight? I'll fight you. Getting all the guys that never met each other into that brotherhood um, has been probably the best part about it. So getting to know everybody, um, hanging out with them after hours and stuff like that, um, getting comfortable with them because on stage we're, we're very close knit. The thing about doing a military show is you gotta get a military haircut. Sit down, soldier. It's hilarious, it's poignant. They'll laugh, they'll cry, they will be moved one way or another. Biloxi Blues will run March 22nd through the 24th. You can find a link to buy tickets for the show on our website, koamnewsnow.com. Hope to see you there. Coming up, people in Russia cast their votes, but the election may already be decided. Sunday marks the third and final voting day in the Russian presidential election. Polling stations opened in Moscow with voters flowing in to cast their ballots. Although there are four candidates running, the election is expected to secure President Vladimir Putin another six more years in power. He faces no serious challengers after anti-war candidates were barred from running. Putin has been in power for almost a quarter of a century. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's call-out this week of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is ruffling some feathers in Washington. The comment coming as the U.S. looks to keep Israel's military operations in Gaza at arm's length. Fox News correspondent Lucas Tomlinson has more. Some lawmakers are outraged over Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's recent floor speech demanding that Israel hold elections calling that speech unprecedented and an example of election interference. Well, I think it's a disgrace uh, what Chuck Schumer said and uh, even more of a disgrace that uh, President Biden said it was a good speech. Uh, this is our strongest ally in the world, it, definitely the Middle East, if not the world. Uh, we have supported them for a very long time. And, and for us, for Chuck Schumer to call for new elections and new leadership in the middle of a war, uh, we're supposed to have their back. Yeah, that, that that wouldn't be my style. I voiced my concerns directly to um, the Israeli you know, government and, and, and folks. I have my issues with how Prime Minister Netanyahu is prosecuting this war. But at the end of the day, it's up to the people of Israel. Here was the Senate's top Democrat earlier this week. I believe a new election is the only way to allow for a healthy and open decision-making process about the future of Israel.
Benny Gantz, arrival of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responding to Schumer saying, Israel is a robust democracy and only its citizens will decide its future and leadership. Any external interference on the matter is counterproductive and unacceptable. President Biden has been at odds with Israel's prime minister. Recall after his State of the Union address, Biden told a group of lawmakers he would have a, quote, come to Jesus talk with the head of the Jewish state. In the Oval Office Friday, Biden appeared to endorse the speech by Schumer and said he was given a heads up. Senator Schumer uh, contacted my staff, my senior staff. He's going to make that speech and uh, he, uh, I'm not going to elaborate on the speech. He made a good speech and I think he uh, expressed a serious concern shared not only by him but by many Americans. President Biden has ordered a thousand American soldiers to build a temporary pier off the coast of Gaza to get more food in. He also signaled he's against Israel's pending offensive into southern Gaza in the city of Rafah where four Hamas battalions and 3,000 soldiers remain. At the White House, Lucas Tomlinson Fox News. Back in the States, the Biden-Harris campaign has now amassed $155 million in cash on hand for the upcoming election, raising $53 million last month alone. February marked the campaign's strongest fundraising month since it launched. The campaign has accumulated a much higher amount in financial support than former President Donald Trump. The Biden-Harris campaign's cash on hand total is the highest amount raised by a Democratic candidate in history, according to the campaign. Doug is next with a next look with the look at the forecast and later reactions from content creators after the House passes a bill that could ban TikTok. Well, I hope you enjoyed your weekend and got outside a little bit. The temperature is pretty good. It was a little chilly outside today, especially with the wind. But yesterday on Saturday, we had really nice temps as we went into the upper 60s of four highs. Not the case today, but still not bad. Most of us 55, 56, 57 degrees during the afternoon. So it wasn't bad, but it is going to get a little bit cooler as we go into tonight and then again into your Monday. It's also been windy. Northerly winds. These are sustained winds kind of in that 15, 20, 25 mile per hour range. And then we've had gusts a little bit higher than that. Uh, the winds are going to stay kind of up there throughout the overnight hours for us tonight. Here's our future wind gusts. So by morning, we're going to still have those northwesterly winds at about 20 to 25. They come down a little bit late in the day tomorrow. They switch out of the south on Tuesday and really get moving by the time we head through the middle of the day on Tuesday. But what that's going to do in return is help our temperatures really warm up by the time Tuesday afternoon rolls around. All right, through the night, we're going to have clear skies, but look at this, down to 26 later on tonight. So it's going to be a nice hard freeze. We have just a few little clouds kind of shooting through, but in general, we have clear skies. We've got some rain down through parts of Texas. Here's our next little upper level wave spinning out across parts of Arizona and New Mexico and that wave. Uh, it's going to take its time, but it's going to start to head in late Wednesday into Thursday, giving us some rain chances by that point in time. So let me walk you through your week. Cold start, mid 20s, Monday morning. It's going to be frosty across uh, parts of the region as we go through the middle of the day. Still those northerly winds, chilly. Temps only right around 40, and then we only get to about 45, 46 degrees for a high, which is well below where we should be for this time of the year. Let's go into Monday night. Still cold, not as cold. We dip back near freezing, but check out your Tuesday. Look at this huge warm up as we press 70 by the time we get into Tuesday afternoon. So yes, cold, but it's short lived. 7 a.m., 26, 39 by noon, 44 by 4, plenty of sunshine. High temp of 45 for you on your Monday. Let's continue through the week. Let's go into Wednesday now. We do have a storm system starting to come out. May give us a random shower by Wednesday evening, but most of Wednesday is going to be dry. This is going to be a weak system, but still will give us some light showers. So now we're looking at Thursday, some light showers pushing through. And then again on Friday, a few light showers working through. But overall, temperatures minus tomorrow are looking pretty good this week. 45 tomorrow, 70 
on Tuesday, 67 on Wednesday, still 64 on Thursday, 66 on Friday. So temperatures all week long are going to be good. We are going to have those hit and miss showers, especially the second half of the week and then uh, into this weekend. Also cooling down a little bit by the time we get into the weekend. All right, thanks, Doug. Coming up, Boeing is adding on to what has already been a long list of issues with its planes. We'll have the latest details. Congress's push to separate TikTok from its Chinese parent company, ByteDance, has focused largely on protecting U.S. national security. But content creators say they're getting left behind in the conversation on what to do with the app that boasts over 100 million U.S. users. Fox News correspondent Lauren Green has more. It was all the talk this week on Capitol Hill, the House voting to move forward on a bill that would force the sale of Chinese-owned TikTok or risk being banned in the United States. The main concerns shared by lawmakers relate to national security, both its influence on users and the potential for data to be shared with the Chinese government. American users are unknowingly contributing to a vast surveillance apparatus, and the potential for abuse of this data is chilling, ranging from targeted advertising to espionage to intelligence gathering. But TikTok's content creators say lawmakers are missing another angle, specifically the impact a ban would have on those who make a living on the app. TikTok is 50% of my income. Jensen Savannah began making TikToks of her travels during the pandemic. Now a full-time influencer with over 400,000 followers, she's tripled her income. She says a ban would not only affect her bottom line, but also the small businesses she promotes. There's one side for the influencers, but again, there's another side on the businesses and that we are really helping locals and drive so much foot traffic into these local businesses that uh, they wouldn't have gotten without TikTok. Lawmakers insist that banning the app is not the goal of the legislation. This legislation separates TikTok's data algorithms and source code from ByteDance. And importantly, this bill does not ban TikTok. The bill now heads to the Senate, but there's currently no timeline on when it will get a vote. In New York, Lauren Green, Fox News. AMC announces that they will broadcast the Summer Olympics at select theaters. NBC Universal and AMC Entertainment announced Wednesday that 160 AMC theaters across the country will stream the Paris Summer Olympics. This is the decision to broadcast the Summer Games comes after AMC's chief executive mentioned broadcasting alternate content after seeing major success with Beyonce and Taylor Swift's concert films. Showings for the Summer Olympics will start on July 27th and end on August 11th. More trouble in the skies for Boeing, the latest in a reportedly long line of trouble that has happened this year. Fox News correspondent Marianne Rafferty has more on the latest mid-air scare for pa passengers. Yet another troubling incident, this time on a United flight out of San Francisco involving another Boeing plane. After that United flight from San Francisco landed in Medford, Oregon on Friday, ground crews found an external panel missing from the underside of the plane. It's unclear when that panel broke off the plane. United Airlines said there was no indication of damage during the flight, adding in a statement, quote, After the aircraft was parked at the gate, it was discovered to be missing an external panel. We'll conduct a thorough examination of the plane and perform all the needed repairs before it returns to service. We'll also conduct an investigation to better understand how this damage occurred. This is just another in a string of mid-air mishaps involving Boeing planes. Last week, a wheel fell off a plane as it was taking off, the tires smashing cars in a parking lot. That was also a United flight. And on March 4th, another United flight from Houston to Florida had to turn around just after takeoff when flames were seen rising from one of its engines. And back in January, an Alaska Airlines flight suffered a blown out door plug. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said the administration has faith in both the FAA and NTSB in ensuring safety in the skies. What our commitment is, is to make sure that uh, we want to put the safety of Americans first. And that's what FAA is doing. Uh, and uh, so they are taking actions. We stand by those actions to increase safety, obviously, and oversight of Boeing. 
The FAA is planning a full investigation into this latest Boeing incident. Marianne Rafferty, Fox News. Up next, an overhead look at an annual Chicago St. Patrick's Day tradition. Chicago goes green to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Thousands gathering for the city's annual tradition on Saturday. The dye in the Chicago River may look toxic, but it is harmless and fades after about five hours. Dyeing the River Emerald is a tradition that goes back to 1962 when the Illinois Office of Tourism says members of the Plumbers Union used green dye to identify the source of leaks into the river. Since then, the event has remained evergreen. 30 more minutes of news, weather, and sports coming your way. Measles has broken out once again in the U.S. We'll have more details when we come back. Measles cases in the U.S. have reached a troubling benchmark. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has reported 58 confirmed cases in 17 states. That's as many as all of last year. The most recent outbreak happened in Chicago with 12 cases this year. But for context, the U.S. saw 121 cases back in 2022. Those were confirmed to just confined to just six jurisdictions. And in 2019, more than 1,200 cases were reported across 31 states. That's the most since 1992. It's been over a week since University of Missouri student Riley Strain disappeared in downtown Nashville after being kicked out of a bar. A massive search effort continues for the 22-year-old. Metro Nashville police say they've cleared the banks of the Cumberland River, where Strain was last seen by people living in homeless camps. Police said no foul play is suspected and officers are treating this as a missing person case. Meanwhile, the Tennessee Alcoholic Beverage Commission is investigating to see if Luke's 32 Bridge Bar overserved Strain and broke state law. Tyson Foods is looking to hire thousands of migrants to fill some of the labor factory jobs. According to a recent report from Bloomberg, the food manufacturing company says it's willing to hire about 52,000 migrants and asylum seekers. Tyson already employs about 42,000 immigrants in its 120,000 U.S. workforce. Typical jobs might be meat washing, placing cuts into trays, and bone inspection with pay starting at $16.50 an hour. Once considered a mecca of spring break, Miami Beach is throwing in the towel this year, hoping to reinvent itself and transform its image after too much rowdiness from college students this time last year. Now students are seeking out the sand further north in Fort Lauderdale. Fox News correspondent Madison Scarpino has more. We're only about 30 miles from Miami Beach, and with all of the new restrictions this year, the party is really moving up here to Fort Lauderdale. The crowds have been growing all day long at the beach, at the bars, but the mayor here says that they're excited about all the spring breakers in town. We welcome people. We want to make sure that when people come here that it's safe and it's, and it's clean. We're excited about hosting spring break, um, mainly because people are just here to have a good time and they're not here to create problems. Last year's chaos in Miami Beach is why the city is breaking up with spring break. There were over 500 arrests last year in the city. The latest example of spring break violence this year happened just south of Daytona Beach Thursday. Police say a 16-year-old pointed a gun at spring breakers on a beach. Thankfully, no one was hurt, and the state attorney says the teen will be charged as an adult. Here in Fort Lauderdale, police say they haven't run into much trouble yet, but they are running into a lot of spring breakers willing to take up a push-up challenge. They're using these next few weeks as an opportunity to recruit the next generation of officers. The vacancies across the nation are uh, exorbitant. So we thought by being a destination city and with young uh, college bound or, or college educated uh, people coming down, uh, we wanted them to consider not only vacationing here, but maybe making this their home. And spring breakers here say things have been relatively calm, but really fun. I feel very, very comfortable everywhere I go. I don't really have to look over my shoulder or, you know, wonder about something going wrong. So it feels amazing. That's one of the big reasons why I love coming out here. 
The mayor says that this weekend and next weekend will bring in the largest crowds. In Fort Lauderdale, Madison Scarpino, Fox News. Still ahead, how two sisters in Philadelphia are helping out the homeless population. Well, I hope you enjoyed your weekend and got outside a little bit. The temperature is pretty good. It was a little chilly outside today, especially with the wind. But yesterday on Saturday, we had really nice temps as we went into the upper 60s of four highs. Not the case today, but still not bad. Most of us 55, 56, 57 degrees during the afternoon. So it wasn't bad, but it is going to get a little bit cooler as we go into tonight and then again into your Monday. It's also been windy. Northerly winds. These are sustained winds kind of in that 15, 20, 25 mile per hour range. And then we've had gusts a little bit higher than that. Uh, the winds are going to stay kind of up there throughout the overnight hours for us tonight. Here's our future wind gusts. So by morning, we're going to still have those northwesterly winds at about 20 to 25. They come down a little bit late in the day tomorrow. They switch out of the south on Tuesday and really get moving by the time we head through the middle of the day on Tuesday. But what that's going to do in return is help our temperatures really warm up by the time Tuesday afternoon rolls around. All right, through the night, we're going to have clear skies. But look at this, down to 26 later on tonight. So it's going to be a nice hard freeze. We have just a few little clouds kind of shooting through. But in general, we have clear skies. We've got some rain down through parts of Texas. Here's our next little upper level wave spinning out across parts of Arizona and New Mexico and that wave. Uh, it's going to take its time, but it's going to start to head in late Wednesday into Thursday, giving us some rain chances by that point in time. So let me walk you through your week. Cold start, mid 20s. Monday morning, it's going to be frosty across uh, parts of the region. As we go through the middle of the day, still those northerly winds, chilly, temps only right around 40, and then we only get to about 45, 46 degrees for a high, which is well below where we should be for this time of the year. Let's go into Monday night. Still cold, not as cold. We dip back near freezing, but check out your Tuesday. Look at this huge warm up as we press 70 by the time we get into Tuesday afternoon. So yes, cold, but it's short lived. 7 a.m., 26, 39 by noon, 44 by four, plenty of sunshine, high temp of 45 for you on your Monday. Let's continue through the week. Let's go into Wednesday now. We do have a storm system starting to come out, may give us a random shower by Wednesday evening, but most of Wednesday is gonna be dry. This is going to be a weak system, but still will give us some light showers. So now we're looking at Thursday, some light showers pushing through. And then again on Friday, a few light showers working through. But overall, temperatures minus tomorrow are looking pretty good this week. 45 tomorrow, 70 on Tuesday, 67 on Wednesday, still 64 on Thursday, 66 on Friday. So temperatures all week long are going to be good. We are going to have those hit and miss showers, especially the second half of the week and then uh, into this weekend. Also cooling down a little bit by the time we get into the weekend. Don't forget, you can be the first to know about the day's weather with the KOAM Skywatch weather app. Get severe weather updates sent straight to your phone free of charge. It's available in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, the KOAM Skywatch weather app. Coming up in sports, it's Selection Sunday as we preview the teams that made this year's NCAA tournament. Plus, Missouri Southern and Pitt State baseball wrap up their weekend series. Brock Baldridge shares the highlights and more up next. The Missouri Southern Lions and the Pittsburgh State Gorillas meet for the final time of the regular season. Now Southern won on Friday, Pitt State won on Saturday, and on Sunday the winner gets to take the series and take home some bragging rights. A little chilly out there on a sunny Sunday afternoon as the Missouri Southern Lions face the Pittsburgh State Gorillas. We pick things up in the top of the third, Web City's Tragen Parker goes deep to right field. And the outfielder is out of room and it's out of here. It's a two run home run. And the Lions take an early 2-0 lead. So we head to the top of the fourth inning now. Dylan Kurihashi Choi Fu makes a spinning throw and fires a bullet to first base for the out. And the Gorillas get out of the inning. So we head to the bottom of the fourth now. 
Austin Warkins steps in at the play and hits a deep fly ball to right field and that ball is going to bounce off the wall out there. Choi Fu will easily come in to score and Warkins picks up an RBI double. Pitt State now trails 2-1. So on the mound for the Lions today, Webb City native Kale McAllister was rolling. Eight innings pitch, seven strikeouts and McAllister is going to get a big swing and a miss here to end the seventh inning. He is fired up. Missouri Southern goes on to beat Pitt State 3-1. And the Lions win the series two games to one. Over to the softball diamond, Pitt State softball wraps up their final non-conference games of the regular season. Once again, the Gorillas continue to dominate. PSU wins the first game 10-4, and then they win the second game 3-2 to complete the sweep. And the Gorillas are 30-2 to begin the season. They just keep on adding on to that 20-game win streak. Well, it is Selection Sunday for the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Tournament, and some teams got in and other teams got left out this year. We start with the Kansas Jayhawks, who are in as the number four seed. Kansas will have to travel to Salt Lake City to face the 13-seeded Samford Bulldogs. That game will be played on TBS. We'll have a late start in that one because the game is scheduled for approximately 8.55 p.m. Central Standard Time. Meanwhile, there are some questions heading into the day regarding some bubble teams. It's the Oklahoma Sooners who are left out of this year's NCAA tournament. OU was one of the first four teams out this year. The Sooners men's basketball team also announced that they have declined an invitational to the NIT tournament. So with that being said, the Sooners season comes to an end with a 20 and 12 record. However, the Kansas State Wildcats did not make this year's tournament, but they did accept an invitation to the NIT. The Wildcats will face the Iowa Hawkeyes on the road. We know the game will be on Tuesday or Wednesday, but the time of the game has yet to be scheduled. Over to MLB Spring Training, the St. Louis Cardinals facing the Houston Astros, top of the first inning. Houston leads one to nothing, and Jose Abreu says goodbye to that baseball. It's a two-run home run. Houston takes that early 3-0 lead. So we fast forward to the bottom of the eighth inning now. Tied up game 6-6, six six, and Brody Moore is up at the plate, and with the bases loaded, he'll touch them all. It's a grand slam, and the St. Louis Cardinals go on to win the game 10-6. Over to spring training in Surprise, Arizona, the Kansas State Royals face off against the Milwaukee Brewers. This game had a long rain delay. They continued for a while, but then they decided to call off the game and it's the Milwaukee Brewers who end up with the victory, winning the game 6-4. And one over sp or a Royals sports note there, uh, Royals also announced during the game that Cole Reagans will be the opening day pitcher. And also, how about the Pittsburgh State Gorillas? 30-2 yeah. and two to begin the season. Yeah. They are the first team in the MIAA this year to pick up 30 wins. And that's softball team. Softball team, softball yes. Softball team. Incredible. The Pitt State Gorillas, they just get more... I, being a newcomer, it's just more and more impressive every time I hear about them. They're, they're fun to watch, fun to hear about. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Brock. Appreciate it. We'll be right back. Two sisters from Virginia are making a huge difference in a neighborhood in Philly, helping to clothe and feed several homeless residents in the area. Fox's Ellen Kaloje has takes us there and has more. Here in the heart of Kensington, among all the drug addiction and mental health issues and homelessness, you'll find Sarnelli House, run by two sisters who moved here from Virginia just to help those in need. I was blown away when I moved here. I was like, Kim, what have you gotten yourself into? Nine years ago, Kim Collins says she had a true calling to come to Philadelphia from Virginia to help people on the streets of Kensington. So many places you don't always feel like you can give people like the love and dignity that they really need and deserve. And I feel like at Sarnelli House, I've been able to invite people into my own home and live with them in their own neighborhood because we also live here. A few years later, her sister Kathleen followed her lead to give back and together they feed thousands of meals to people who they say need a lot of love. It's not just for addicts. They're out here for everybody. They don't care where background you come from, what you, you've done in the past, just come here. The sisters say living right here among the people they serve makes all the difference, helping them not only understand what everyone goes through every single day, but also builds real friendships. Kim, Kathleen, they're great people. Everybody volunteer here is great people. We're not just volunteer workers, we're, we're family. 
a family that serves up more than just food and kindness, but also true fellowship and even clothing on certain days of the week. This is somewhere where they can go. But yeah, I mean, any, for anybody, anybody who needs help is always welcome here. It doesn't matter what kind of help or who you are or whether or not you live in the neighborhood or if you have like an illness, you could just come here. If it helps, great. <laughs> We're just here to love people. And hopefully with that, we can inspire somebody to try something new with their life. An adorable Humboldt penguin makes its grand entrance at the Oregon Zoo. The fluffy little chick emerged from its shell earlier this month, sporting its grayish brown colors. Experts say the unnamed penguin will continue to grow and be about as big as its parents by the summer, but it won't develop the iconic black and white tuxedo coloring for a few years. Up next, how a senior dog found his forever home with a senior woman. One senior dog in Texas has waited years to find his forever home, and his wish has finally come true. Meet Velcro, formerly known as Beluga. The 10-year-old Carolina dog mix has special <laughs> needs, including being partially blind and deaf, and has some mobility issues. He arrived at the Austin Pets Alive Shelter in 2022 and had spent over 700 days there. In, then in February, 74-year-old Jeanette walked in and felt the dog was meant for her after spending time with him. She bought him. She brought him home under foster care with the intention of adopting. Jeanette says while Velcro has since bloomed, he has the character of a calm old gentleman. Well, that's all our time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll leave you with a video of the Okapai calf at the Cincinnati Zoo. From all of us here at KOAN, have a great night.